This is Thursday, September 20th, 2012. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Robert W. Wright. Welcome, Bob. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Well, thank you for coming. <clears throat> May I ask when you were born? I was born on February 10th, in 1948. And where were you born? Uh, right here in Natick at the Leonard Morris Hospital. And where do you currently live? I live in Northampton, New Hampshire. Your marital status? I'm single. Do you have children? I don't have children that I'm aware of. Tell us what Natick was like growing up. Natick was a great place to grow up. Um, it seemed to be a good mix of everything. Um, the schools were very good at the time. Uh, our whole society was very much more civilized at the time. <laughs> um, and even though I grew up in the Veterans Housing Project, um, people that may have a negative connotation, it was still mm -hmm. a very good place to grow up. Exactly <clears throat> where was the Veterans uh, Housing you mentioned? It's actually uh, about half a mile from where the high school still is. Mm -hmm. uh, but overall, I, I thought growing up in Natick was a great place to live and to grow up, everything about it. Okay. <clears throat> where and when did you enter the military? Um, I enlisted uh, in Framingham in late September 1966, and there was a delayed entry program, so I didn't officially report till January 31st of 67. And why did you enter? Um, well, originally um, I had planned to enter the Marines. Mm -hmm. um, Natick was a big sports town. Every, all us guys were m a little more macho at the time. Uh, my father had been a Marine, even though I didn't know much about him. And it was kind of the thing where a lot of us guys talked about being a Marine, you know, mm -hmm. Natick. And at the time, we were all very patriotic individuals. Uh, my mother said that she would not let me enter the Marines because of whatever happened with my father. And uh, at that time, there was just a straight draft. There was no lottery number, mm -hmm. no anything like that. And I, I seem to recall that we understood that if you weren't in college and if you were 19 years and one month, you would be drafted mm -hmm. generally into the Army. So part of the thinking with some of us was, well, rather than get drafted, maybe I can join and learn something, you know. Mm -hmm. So I said, yeah, maybe I could join the Navy and maybe I can learn something or at least the old saying, see the world, you know. Right. So. Now you're mentioning your father. Are you able to say what happened to him? Well, as a child, I really didn't know much of anything about him. Um, I knew that he had been in the Marines. There was a nice photo on my mother's um, bureau. Mm -hmm. um, I deduced that he had had some medical issues, uh, but nobody ever really sat me down and told me. Uh -huh. It was only really about a few years ago <clears throat> Uh, when I was able to get some more documents um, from the military, uh, essentially what had happened was he went to Marine boot camp during World War II. And I don't know if it had happened prior or it developed while he was there, but he developed grand mal epilepsy. So he um, ended up eventually being, uh, you know, honorably but medically discharged and he was in the VA hospital for pretty much all of his life. And uh, I didn't really know much. My mother never discussed it really mm. with us. So I, I, I didn't really actually meet him until I was in my 40s. And then the nurses filled us in more. And um, so I get to see him and his personality and all that. And, mm -hmm. um, and my sister really wanted to meet him because she remembers him, whereas I didn't remember him. And we didn't want our mother to know, because we had the normal curiosity to meet your father, right. you know. But it, it was obviously a big issue for my mother. And, my, and the nurses actually felt badly for my mother because 
you know, the intensity of his seizure, you know, it's a very difficult thing uh -huh. to deal with. When I was in college, I have degrees in psychology, it wasn't until that time that, um, it wasn't until the 50s, late 50s, that they discovered that epilepsy was a medical condition that could be controlled with medication. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, they, they thought it was a form of mental disorder. Mm -hmm. So for a while he was apparently at Westboro State Hospital. Um, and of course then once they discovered that even the grand mal epilepsy could be controlled, uh, he was ready to be discharged. Um, I remember in high school I get a call one day from a nurse saying, hey, your father's ready to come home. And I, I, I didn't know what to say, you know. And, uh, and I told my mother and she was horrified. She didn't want him home. Um, and then apparently he was able to, he, he lived at the Bedford VA for quite a while. And he was able to go out and travel on his own and work. But still, he, despite the medication, he still would have some serious seizures. Mm -hmm. And I, had, I remember as a child going to see him a couple of times up at Bedford. I don't think I saw him, but just being in there, you know, it was, you know, kind of a weird experience. Mm -hmm. But then I was thrilled in my 40s to go see him and meet him and see that his basic personality was still there. He wasn't, I mean, he was a little institutionalized. Mm -hmm. And again, I study a lot of this stuff in psychology, so I, I, mean, I might speak in psychobabble, but um, in overall, I was happy that he was receiving really good care. And they all loved him. He had a great personality. Mm -hmm. So it, it was really heartwarming to see that, you know. And of course, he was thrilled to see his kids, you know. Mm -hmm. he, he had never seen his kids. Yeah. <clears throat> is, uh, is he still with us? No, he, um, excuse me. That's okay. He passed in um, December 1st of 2001. Mm -hmm. They had transferred him up to, um, no, he was still in Bedford, but he had a heart attack. During one of his seizures, years in the past, he had broken a hip, mm -hmm. and my mother didn't authorize the surgery, so he, he was in a wheelchair quite a bit. Uh, but boy, what a grip he had from working that <laughs> wheel. He used to break my hand when I shook his hand. Wow. Um, but anyway, he, he did suffer a heart attack. They sent him out to Lawrence, and he recovered initially, but a short time later he died in December. Mm -hmm. So we, we were able to see him, you know, within the last 24 hours. Okay. Anyway. Well, let's get back to you uh, enlisting in the Navy, mm -hmm. and this is 1967. Right. Of course, Vietnam was the hot topic. It was. Um, getting back to why I enlisted, mm -hmm. again, we were all patriotic, macho kind of guys in Natick. A lot of the teachers and coaches were ex-Marine DI drill instructors. We did mm -hmm. all the physical stuff, which was great. You know, mm -hmm. we, were, we, were, we were tough guys, but we, you know, we, we enjoyed that. And, um, uh, but at that time, and even though I grew up in the veterans housing project, the attitude at that time was, you know, you need to do your duty for your country. That was just pretty much, and all of us thought that, you know. I mean, some kids went to college, and despite Vietnam or not, mm -hmm. we were going to do our duty for our country. We felt that we should do that. That was the patriotism and the feeling at the time in, in, mm -hmm. in this country. So. At the time, uh, when you were watching uh, TV or listening to the radio, what was the coverage of Vietnam like? It wasn't too much, and mm -hmm. that wouldn't have made any difference to me anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, <clears throat> aside from the attitude of maybe if I join something versus get drafted, I might be able to learn something. And I, mm -hmm. I had been a, a straight-A student all through school, but I had no mm -hmm. money for college. Mm -hmm. um, and also the adventure, just growing up. Um, so even though I was slightly aware of Vietnam, that didn't bother me at all. You know? mm -hmm. I mean, you, you're my, the old, in the old days, we were pretty macho in our mentality, you know, mm -hmm. whether it be sports or, um, and we had a real strong value system, not only in our school, but in Natick and in the, in the whole country. Mm -hmm. uh, our, our country 
Everybody had manners, responsibility, you work for a living. We lived in a housing project. Nobody hmm. collected welfare. My mother went to work, even though she probably could have collected welfare, but mm -hmm. every, you know, we were just very responsible. Mm -hmm. Even as kids, we were responsible. So. And what did your mom do for a living? She, uh, for a while, she waitressed up mm -hmm. at the Marador there, up on Route 9. In fact, she, uh, a lot of times the Red Sox were going there. She had waited on Ted Williams and those guys a couple of times. Mm -hmm. uh, but then eventually she got a good job with the telephone company in Framingham, which she eventually retired from. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she was just, she was just the old fashioned operator where you plug in the right. one mm -hmm. ringy date. Yep. And, uh, but, uh, so she retired, they had good benefits, obviously. Mm -hmm. So that was an excellent uh, situation for her. Mm -hmm. When you joined the Navy, did family or friends join the service when you did? Well, uh, again, a bunch of us guys in town and some of my friends and classmates were joining. Um, and, um, no real close friends. I was one of the initial, the earlier ones to join mm -hmm. uh, versus wait to get drafted. A lot of the guys get drafted mm -hmm. and they waited for that. And a lot of them did join the Marines. Um, and um, when the night before I left, they had a party for me and the brother of this other guy that I used to know and he was going into the Navy as well. So they had a party for us. And mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't say he was a friend, he was an acquaintance. Right. Now, where were you sent for basic training? Very cold up in uh, the Great Lakes Naval Training Center in, uh, <laughs> up north of uh, Illinois. I guess it's, I can't remember the actual town. It's up near Waukegan, Illinois. Mm -hmm. On January 31st, uh, very cold, very cold. <laughs> <laughs> Aside from very cold, tell us what basic was like. Um, overall, when I went in the military, I expected anything. Like I said, my mentality was, I'm going to go in the Marines and got to grow up, and whatever they throw at me, I'm going to do it, you know. Um, it wasn't as tough as, like, the Marine boot camp. The one thing that happened was I didn't realize until the 31st of January, we reported to Boston, and they got a whole bunch of guys from the Boston and, and Massachusetts area and we were a special company going to the Great Lakes called Boston Company. They swore us in under the guns of the USS Boston, which was a guided missile mm -hmm. cruiser. So then when we got to boot camp, um, we were, you know, the other, guy, the other guys didn't like us because we were kind of considered like a special company, Boston <laughs> Company, you know? plus we were Yankees, you know. So, but also the drill instructor, um, I don't know if he had orders or what it was, but he was extra tough on us. He was determined that we were going to be the best company up there at Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. All the companies would compete with each other on all kinds of things. And indeed, in the end, we were the best. At the time, we were the best that ever went through there. He made, he pushed us. Um, he pushed us, you know, you, you get tested on uh, academic type of stuff, the physical stuff, the drills. Um, you actually had to pass a lot of swimming tests, obviously, for the Navy. Uh, and we had a swim team. We almost set the, the, uh, the record for the Great Lakes. Um, and um, so he was determining, determined, no matter what we thought, that we were going to be the best. <laughs> and thus, he, it made it tougher because um, you, know, you had inspections of the barracks every day, and then once a week you had a major one, and they graded you. So instead of getting up at like five um, and then getting ready and then marching up to get chow, he got us up at four and it was, we were out on the grounds at like 4.30, mm -hmm. standing at attention for two hours before the chow hall opened. Then when we came, you know, to keep us out of the barracks so they could clean it properly. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, when we came back after chow, we wouldn't let in, so we would sit in the hallway but long story short, um, you know, we didn't get a, the normal amount of sleep that we should have got. Mm -hmm. Other than that, uh, boot camp is boot camp. You know, you, they're taking uh, young, immature, naive guys and building them into disciplined military, whether it be the Marines or the Army or the Navy or whatever. And in the, in the process, you have to weed out some of the guys. So 
you know, some of the guys uh, he was extra hard on because they were weak physically. Of course, each one of them was right beside me. Um, and, but there, again, a lot of discipline, a lot of drilling, a lot of training. It was very cold the whole time. Um, and then in the process of that, a couple of the guys, they call it a setback. They get mm -hmm. set back. In fact, one of them was an admiral's son. And he was a, just a pudgy little guy. And the other guy beside me was a Jewish guy. He was the only Jewish guy. And nobody was prejudiced to him at all. Mm -hmm. But again, he was weak. So they especially picked on, picked more hard on them, and every time they screwed up, we all had to do more push-ups, and mm. I never realized how many push-ups I could do, you know. <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, boot camp is boot camp. Mm -hmm. it, it, I'm sure it, it wasn't as tough as, like, probably the Army and Marines, where, there, where you might be doing some physical combat. You know, we focus on other things, but still the drill, and um, it's meant to be tough, you know. Okay. What about specialized training? Um, <clears throat> right in the Navy boot camp, you get a lot of specialized training to swim, survival at sea, putting out fires, a lot of specialized stuff to prepare you for life on board a ship and disasters on a ship. Um, afterwards, I didn't go to a specialized school like some of the guys did. There was a thing at the time they called the needs of the Navy. In other words, when I went in the military, you were guaranteed nothing. It's not like nowadays where you could take a test. Okay, we'll, we'll put you in this school to learn that. There was none of that. And um, so I get sent to, a bunch of us get sent to uh, Naval Air Station North Island, San Diego, to a squadron. I was an Airedale, they call them. I'm mm -hmm. glad that I was. But they sent me there as a jet mechanic, and the planes were all prop jobs, propeller jobs, you know. So right away I'm like, needs of the Navy, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. But then once you get there, then um, in my first squadron, uh, you get specialized training right there. In other words, eventually after I did the barracks jobs and the chow hall and all that stuff, um, they trained me all about the plane. Uh, my title became even though I was an enlisted man, my title became a plane captain. And a plane captain is responsible, the person responsible to have the aircraft all set to go in a moment's notice. It involves everything, inspections, maintenance, fueling, everything. Uh, something happens, that plane's got to go, I have to be there, and it's got to be ready to go. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to learn all about that, and then they test you on that. And then same, similar thing, we all learn the weapons uh, specific to that aircraft, mm -hmm. not only what they were, but how to load them, including nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. torpedoes, and we actually had to practice doing that. Mm -hmm. So initially, once I started training to be a plane captain, that's the training that I got there. And a few of us all came from the same uh, Boston company out mm -hmm. there, and we all did it together. Then, um, after a while, then they put me in supply. I, I wasn't real happy. I had worked at Sears in the warehouse. Part of joining the Navy was to get adventure, and mm -hmm. uh, so then now they put me back in the supply. Uh, and I guess most guys would have thought it was great, but I, I wanted to be out mm -hmm. doing the plane cap and stuff, uh, working on the planes. Um, so my supervising officer and two of the other guys that work with me they said, Bob, you ought to be an uh, air crewman. Um, the first squadron I was in was anti-submarine uh, squadrons. The planes were prop jobs with highly sophisticated um, equipment. Mm -hmm. the, the military always gets the most highly sophisticated stuff years before the civilian world does. Yeah. And even though it was just an old prop job, the, the electronics gear on that was unbelievable. So anyway, I started training. I, I hadn't thought of it. I started training, taking the training to be a plane captain. So I started doing that survival training. Uh, part of the training was you had to learn and memorize what all the Russian submarines look like so that if they were at the surface, you knew exactly which mm -hmm. ones. Um, and I, so I just started doing that. and. Um, then uh, finally, after a while, I was just starting the training, and they said, 
they have a new rule that if somebody's going to be an air crewman, they want them to, to have an, uh, 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 a job description of avionics is what it was. So that if you're in the air, in the air on a mission and one of the black boxes breaks down, you might actually be able to fix it and save the mission. And I didn't know anything about avionics. I <laughs> wasn't interested in it, so I dropped out. But in the, in the meantime, it was, uh, it was kind of funny. In fact, one of the photos is kind of funny there. Um, I was scheduled to fly about on five different occasions as part of my training. And the first two times, I didn't even get suited up. They canceled the hop. They call them a hop when mm -hmm. you go out to fly. Then the next three times, I actually got on the runway. The pilot's, you know, he's revving it up. And I said, oh, finally, we're getting up. And he pulls back. In fact, one time the pilot was my supervising uh, officer, and he says, hey, how'd you like that, right? I said, what? I, I couldn't even understand what he was saying with the intercom. <laughs> <laughs> and then they were all chuckling, you know, that mm -hmm. the plane, you know, something on the plane went down, so mm -hmm. that the hop had to get scratched. Yeah. Um, so this happened three times. So all of a sudden I come in one day, and all of a sudden I'm Sky King. You know? <laughs> so that stuck with me for quite a while. So which, uh, which photo was this? Here I am uh, on one of the times mm -hmm. when I was scheduled to, uh, to actually fly. I'm all suited up, getting a photo, show the folks back home what I'm doing. And I'm still smiling and uh -huh. 18 going on three, <laughs> like a kid at Christmas, basically. Um, but Santa Claus didn't come. <laughs> no, he didn't. Um, so in hindsight, though, and uh, apparently somebody was watching over me because mm -hmm. um, the two guys that came after me uh, that actually, they ended up actually in the same spot that I would have had. Uh, the first guy, he got seriously injured. We had a mid-air collision off the coast of Hawaii. He lost an arm and his face mask just destroyed his face. And he was a nice guy. He wanted to, right off the bat, he wanted to be in for a career. And, um, and I didn't even get to know him that well, but he was mm -hmm. a great guy. And then the guy who replaced him, when we were over in the Tonkin Gulf, um, it appears that they took a direct hit. They just disappeared off the radar screen. So the, you know, there but by, by the grace of God mm -hmm. go I, you know, so. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and even year, you know, it, it didn't hit me as much until years later, you know, and even now, thinking about it, mm -hmm. you know, you look back and you say, wow, that could have been me, you know. Hmm. So you're, you're still stationed in San Diego, it's still sometime in 1967? Yeah, the, I got to, I got out of boot camp in April of 67. I was in, working in supply on the base for a while, till I saw working on the planes, and we, we took a couple of cruises off the coast. They always do that to train the new pilots especially, mm -hmm. but to train us on the flight deck. The flight deck is very dangerous. And uh, so then we actually departed from San Diego. I think it was, I think it was Christmas Day, 1967. Um, and basically, the, it's called uh, taking a, a Westpac cruise. It's short for Western Pacific. Um, and essentially, again, the ship, all the carriers went to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And then again, they did a lot more further intensive training for the pilots. Landing an aircraft on a carrier is very mm -hmm. difficult, let alone training all the new crew. It's very dangerous. And like the first couple of days, they have you with somebody else who's very experienced. Um, I mean, just showing you watch out for this, watch out for that, you gotta have a head in a swivel. Even before all that, when I was in San Diego, they showed us all the films of what can happen, mm -hmm. what can go wrong in a flight deck. You know, people getting cut in half, blown over. They showed us the, they showed us the um, film on the Forrestal fire. And they not only showed it, but they explained what went wrong and why it occurred. Can Is you it, give us a little bit of background for the Forrestal? Uh, the Forrestal, um, I think it was actually in the Atlantic. I, I can't mm -hmm. remember. It was before I was in the Navy, and um, I'm trying to not get confused. The Enterprise also had an incident. The mm -hmm. Forrestal fire, 
uh, they were getting prepared for a launch and they had a lot of the planes on the stern or the fan tail of the ship getting ready, turning up. Uh, they do the final safety checks and, uh, and, so the, and they were loaded with ordnance too, with rockets, mm -hmm. bombs, stuff like that. And so the, the report we got when I got the training was that somebody did not have a non-sparking tool and they were doing something on the bomb rack which set off a rocket because all of a sudden you could uh -huh. see something go whizzing by and then the camera panned up to the front of the ship and it hit, um, it had hit one of the planes up front. Um, and then uh, another, and then it happened two or three other times and the rocket went kind of crazy across the deck and hit some of the planes. Um, so then all of a sudden there's fires and aviation gasoline, or in this case JP-5 jet fuel, is extremely flammable and hot as we mm -hmm. can vouch by the World Trade Center. Right. You know. um, so then several of the planes were on fire, so immediately all the crews, all of us were trained to fight fires and fight fires on the flight deck and exactly what we had to do. So everybody's rushing out, and at the time they didn't. Re they thought that if a 500-pound bomb, uh, if it was subjected to extreme heat, within 12 minutes it would explode. Mm -hmm. They learned from this incident that after six minutes, all the 500-pound bombs were. So all of a sudden, you're seeing fire. You're seeing a bunch of guys fighting the fire, big fires, boom, and a plane's gone, and all the guys are gone. Uh, and then the fuel is spilling all over. This is mostly on the rear part of the deck, although there was that plane in, uh, up front. And then, um, I didn't realize it till a couple of years ago, but then there was one plane and the aviation, the JP-5 had surrounded one plane. So there was a fire all around the plane. It was a Skyhawk, an A-4 Skyhawk. So then it showed the pilot getting out and he had to jump in the fire. So he got out to the front and he jumped off into the fire and immediately one of the uh, chief petty officers came with a portable extinguisher and made a path for him so he could get out. Turns out that was John McCain. Wow. And at the time I didn't know anything about John McCain, you know. So anyway, um, the, um, the other thing that happened was uh, you know, it was a big disaster, and, the other, and of course you get 500 pound bombs exploding right on the flight deck, mm -hmm. which is a pretty sturdy deck, but a 500 pound bomb, it's making holes in the deck. All the JP-5 fuel is going down on fire and burning guys down below, you know, so it, it was a major disaster. Mm -hmm. And, but it turns out what they had taught us turned out to be wrong. I, I just learned on the military channel that it wasn't that it was a non-sparking tool that did it. Um, they had changed uh, the basic training procedures for the ordnance men. Usually they would wait till the plane is right on the catapult before they pull the final safety pins like mm -hmm. on the rockets. But they got in the habit of pulling them while they were all parked and wait before they even taxi. So and then there was something else, something else technical that happened and, and that's what initially wow. caused it. So they went back to the original safety procedures, mm -hmm. which you see the guys in the red shirts, those are the ordnance men. At the very last, when the plane is just about getting set to get on the catapult, then they'll pull the final pins mm -hmm. and you go up, and I used to have to do it too, you go up and you show the pilot, he has to count them to know that all the safety pins are mm -hmm. out. So. All right, so Bob, your Western Pacific cruise, what yep. was your uh, rank of duties? Well, I was plane captain, like I was okay. saying. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was with the squadron, but I, I worked on the flight deck. Mm -hmm. And um, and again, and it's ex it's extra important on the on the carrier. I cannot leave that plane unless I'm relieved by somebody, not even to eat, mm -hmm. because if there's emergency, I have to sit in the cockpit and ride the brakes while they're moving the plane around. Uh, or if they had an emergency launch, I might have to be there to make sure there's enough fuel mm -hmm. in it, make sure it's all set to go. Mm -hmm. So um, the, um, 
Um, you know, so what I was doing on land was even more important on sea. In fact, you know, here's a good example of the training. On land, we were told, once we were trained, they said if a pilot is taxiing in uh, on land, and they don't follow your directions, you know, you give them signals and all, if they don't follow them exactly, you just stop them, go in and have a coffee. And I had to do that once with a pilot. Because if you do that on the ship, you're over the side, you know. Mm -hmm. the, so the pilot, the pilots knew that we would do that. And I did it with one guy. I go in and get a coffee. I come back. I finally taxi him in. He said, "What, what was wrong?" I said, "You didn't follow my directions." And I could tell he was a little miff, but <laughs> he knew. I mean, he knew he was wrong. You know? right. And it was to save his life. Now, um, what uh, what was the ship you were on? This was the USS Yorktown. I was okay. I was assigned to. Air Anti-Submarine Squadron 23. The short for that is VS-23. Mm -hmm. In the Navy, Navy Aviation, V stands for air, mm -hmm. S stands for submarine, anti-submarine. Mm -hmm. um, and I was on the USS Yorktown. This was the second USS Yorktown. The first one was sunk during World War II. This one was built in 1943. So it was the old Essex-style carrier. And right before we get on it, it had gone into dry dock, I think in Norfolk, and they put the angle deck on it. The newer mm -hmm. carriers all came that way, but they put the angle mm -hmm. deck. And of course, at this time, um, most people probably don't realize, but you know, with the Cold War and with the communism, uh, the Soviet, we, at the time, we called them Russians. It wasn't the Soviet Union. Uh, they had Russian subs everywhere, nuclear Russian subs. So that's why they specifically had anti-submarine squadrons like ours and specific aircraft carriers just mm -hmm. for that. Um, so the USS Yorktown at that time was called CVS-10, mm -hmm. C for carrier, V for air, and S for anti-submarine. Um, so we, uh, and actually, Usually, we'll get on the ship and we'll get out to sea and the planes will fly out. On this occasion, we actually towed all the planes down from the, uh, the flight line all the way down to the, the ship in San Diego Harbor, and they actually uh, hoisted them on deck, which is very unusual. Mm. They might have just wanted to have practice doing that. I don't know. <laughs> it took us all day to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so then we, uh, we sailed out, and initially, like I said, we'd go to Hawaii for more, they call it carrier Car calls, carrier qualifications, again to get more practice for the mm -hmm. pilots and the flight deck crew, um, and then from there would we would normally stop in Japan mm -hmm. to get some supplies, and then head down to the Tonkin Gulf from there. Mm -hmm. um, and and at that time there would be anywhere from two to four carrier groups in the Tonkin Gulf. A lot of them were the other attack carriers with the jets mm -hmm. and in our group. So that's kind of a summary of, you know, mm -hmm. what the mission was and mm -hmm. it didn't turn out that way, however. Yeah. So uh, you're born and raised in Natick and this is, is this, was this really your first time traveling anywhere? Yeah, it really uh -huh. was. Um, you know, it just, you know, you talk about young and naive. I mean, I had been out of Natick, but I, <laughs> you know, I was like 18 going on 10. You know, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't know one thing <laughs> from another. Um, you're a kid, you know. And uh, so, yeah, and, and again, it's, it's an adventure. You know, mm -hmm. really, I think most of us guys at the time, just be, being young and macho, you're looking for adventure. You mm -hmm. think you're invulnerable. You don't even think of death. You know? mm -hmm. So we're now heading late 67 into early 68, and you're now in the Tonkin Gulf of Vietnam? No, there was uh, actually, we had a pit stop before that. Tell us about the pit stop. Uh, major pit stop. Um, mm -hmm. We were, first of all, we were practicing off Hawaii, and um, I, I don't know why, but two of our planes, one of our planes and our sister squadron, they had a mid-air collision. Um, it was a beautiful day. I had just left the flight deck, and I heard the the the, the flight uh, I forgot his forgot his title now. The flight deck officer mm -hmm. say something. I thought he said collision. So I run back up. And I see this plane coming down. I see four parachutes, and the plane crashes into the water. But I saw the four parachutes, 
And then the, the flight deck chief, he gets on, he said, there's been a mid-air collision. Um, the plane from VS-23 is heading towards Barking Sands, Hawaii. Uh, turns out that our pilot got killed instantly, so the co-pilot flew it in. That's when my mm -hmm. friend, he lost his arm and he mm -hmm. got his face mangled. And they actually did a crash landing onto Barking Sands, Hawaii. Um, so then, um, you know, that was quite an event. And, and again, this is part of the reason for having carrier qualifications. Mm. You know, it's dangerous work. And uh, I never heard officially why that even would happen. Obviously, one of the pilots must have made an error as far as where he's supposed to go after he's launched. Mm -hmm. So then, um, so then we're coming into Pearl, and um, um, well, I'll save that to the end. You have a question on there about memorable experiences. I'll mm -hmm. talk about Pearl later. All right. Apparently, my mother had heard that we had had a crash on the flight deck, and we were throwing the planes over the side, and she was calling, trying to find out what's going on. Everybody was calling. So, so anyway, then we're leaving Pearl to head out to continue the cruise, and uh, apparently the commander that we lost, he had had in his will to be buried at sea. And um, so again, it was a beautiful morning. Of course, we went very slowly, and it was a nice, peaceful ocean at, on that day, and beautiful day. And we're on the flight deck, and they put one of the um, elevators down to the hangar bay level, mm -hmm. and they had them all set to, you know, they have a whole procedure. And then all of a sudden, I remember his wife coming out. I don't remember kids. You know, so it was very solemn, you know, mm -hmm. that was very solemn. And he was, in the Navy, there was the enlisted men and the officers. And I'm not trying to be really negative, but they were like two separate navies. Mm -hmm. and this guy was an older officer, and I, I learned. I dealt with all the officers and the pilots because I was up there mm -hmm. getting their planes, strapping them in, getting everything ready to go before the launch. You know, so I got to know the officers, and he he was one of the nicer ones. Um, years later, now I get on the. Um, they have all these military websites, unit pages, and um, you get messages from their kids. Does anybody remember my father? And, and boy, it really s s struck home, you know. He's a kid who barely knew his father and just trying to get feedback about their father, mm -hmm. you know. So I, I answered him. I, you know, I had nothing but good to say anyway, and mm -hmm. he was, he felt so good about that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so then, so anyway, then we're heading, the schedule to go to Japan. Um, I remember vividly um, I'm walking down the hangar bay, and the bosun whistle goes off, and it's the captain. And usually the captain didn't speak to us on, uh, on, the, on the intercom. And he says, um, the North Koreans have captured one of our ships. Uh, the, we don't know if we're at war. Um, the president has asked us to go um, immediately to the area. So when you hear uh, battle stations, general quarters, he said, it's called battle stations, make sure you move. Mm -hmm. Which we did anyway, but once we heard battle stations after that. So, um, so here we are, you know, we're going up into the Sea of Japan. We stopped in Sasebo for supplies. And we didn't know anything, you know, and um, so uh, we're, you know, we're all pretty sober at this point. We're prepared for anything. And the issue, the big issue was we were the, an old style aircraft carrier with five inch guns and all the destroyers had five inch guns, but we had none of the high tech missiles, cruisers, and we didn't have much for self defense. Our planes were propeller planes built for anti-sub. Now we could put rockets on there, but they were very slow mm -hmm. planes, not no match for a jet. So um, we get up there and of course it's getting colder. This was in late January um, of 68. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, they're giving us all this foul weather gear. We not only had to be on the flight deck, but to take care of our planes, we had to get on the planes, 
fuel them, do maintenance. And of course, it's windy under normal conditions, let alone when you're launching a plane and stuff. But then we're getting snow and ice. Mm. Um, so you get a hazardous job that's really made hazardous. And the cold weather gear at the time was not the high-tech stuff they have now. I, they gave me a mask. As you can see, I have it here in one of the photos. Mm -hmm. And long johns and no special boots or anything, no special hat or gloves. Uh, but they told us that, and they gave us flares. They told us if we fell over, it'd be six minutes before we froze. Um, and then they, they also gave us a flare in case we did fall over. We could do a flare so if at night they could see us. We always on the flight deck wore vests that were inflatable. You just go like that. Mm -hmm. So if we were in the water, it would keep us afloat. Um, and then they gave us like rope with hooks on it so that when we were on top of the plane, we could hook ourselves to the plane in case the plane was icy and would slide off, you know, and, and the planes were parked right along the edge of the flight deck, you know, so mm -hmm. if you fell off one side, you're going 90 feet below. Um, so anyway, um, we, um, uh, it's getting colder, and then on top of that, they told us, just go up and do what you have to do and come back down. Try not to stay up there for too long, um, but sometimes you had to, you know, and, um, so then we get up there, and the very first day we're up in the Sea of Japan, we're heading right outside of Wonsan Harbor where the Pueblo was, where they mm -hmm. captured the Pueblo. And all of a sudden, in course, the Russian subs were everywhere. When we left San Diego, we left in, when we hit international waters, a Russian sub was waiting for us. I mean, mm -hmm. these things were everywhere. And here we are on the Sea of Japan, which is North Korea, and the big... Russian bases up there, so the Russian subs were all around. Right. Yeah. Um, so all of a sudden there's this trawler behind us on the port stern, which is like the left side to the mm -hmm. rear, about, about a quarter of a mile. And we're looking at it, and they told us it was a Russian trawler. And essentially what was happening was, uh, we're right up in their territory, but they didn't have aircraft carriers. So they were studying what we did, you know, they're trying to learn from us. And then the first couple of days, a lot of these news planes uh, were flying around right over us, you know, filming us, and, you know, we didn't know what was going on, but the rest of the world did. Mm -hmm. um, so then, um, so we're doing our regular operations, and uh, it, um, you know, we're being extra careful, but as you can see, I mean, we had snow. I wish they kept the snow on because... Mm -hmm. When you shovel the snow off, it's all ice then. You have no footing at all. Um, and um, uh, yeah, show them what uh, Yeah, what you can't you even tell through. it's me. I just have my cold weather gear. I'm holding a snowball. Just to, <laughs> again, these are photos for the folks back home mm -hmm. just, to, just to show what was happening. Mm -hmm. um, so then, um, and that was the first time. I had four times in the flight deck where I really came close to getting either severely injured or just outright enough to get washed overboard. Mm -hmm. um, on the Yorktown, we used to, they had the angle deck, but they used to line the planes up on one of the bow catapults, one behind the other. And um, um, so my plane was like third or fourth, and there was no barrier between the one they were launching, and, and the other ones were idling in front. They were all idling. Finally, it comes time where they give me the signal to take, all the planes were tied down with chains to the deck uh, all the time, you know, when they weren't flying. So I had to go get the ones off the front of the plane and the props are over there going. And so I get them off and I'm carefully walking and then they launch a plane, two planes ahead of me, and it's all ice. So I got blown down and not only get blown down, but I'm still sliding on the ice towards the propeller. And I mean, the propeller is up here, but the mm -hmm. way the physics are, it would pull you right up into mm -hmm. it, you know. So in the deck, there's all these pad eyes. They're an indentation with a cross, and that's where you chain the, the plane. So I grab the pad eye, and it stopped me from going back into the props. So then the, the plane went. So then they're saying, come on, go on. I said, oh, no, no, you cut the plane, you cut the engine, you know, so they mm -hmm. cut the engine. And, you know, I was clear as a bell, 
in emergency situations, I've always been pretty lucid. Mm. But then after the fact, it's like, geez, that was a close <laughs> one, you know. All the other guys were more nervous than I was because they saw it happen, you know. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, so that was one of the first times I really almost bought it. They had showed us guys in San Diego, guys who got injured on the flight. They showed us all the films, too. And it's mm -hmm. pretty nasty. Uh, but anyway, um, so then we're doing our operations. We're doing pretty good, no accidents. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, I was below deck one day. My plane was flying. Right, I was right below the flight deck. And again, we don't know if we're at war, you know. And we're ready for anything. So all of a sudden, and we're sitting ducks, basically. Um, years later, I found out that the North Koreans had 100 MiGs, MiGs armed and ready to go if, if we did anything, you know, and we didn't know that at the time. So anyway, all of a sudden, we get a message, unidentified bogey 60 miles out. And that means there's a plane that we don't know, and it's heading towards us. And um, so we're below there, and we're at battle stations, obviously and unidentified bogey 40 miles out. And again, all we had was five-inch guns. We, so finally they say, it's a Russian badger. The Russians had three big bombers, a badger, a bear, and a bison. And these things are huge. Mm -hmm. And we're right up in their territory. And again, we didn't know what was happening. Um, unidentified bogey is 30 miles out. Then all of a sudden they say, close all circle William fittings. When they say that, they're cutting off all the ventilation shafts throughout the shift. And that's one of the uh, ways of preparing for a nuclear attack. And again, this is a Cold War when nukes were a big concern, not that they aren't now. And when they, say that, when they said that, we all looked at each other. And a couple of my friends were actually from Ashland and around here. And we actually said our goodbyes. We said, this is it. We shook hands. Hey, if you get back go see my family, <clears throat> and um, so all of a sudden, uh, Bogey is 20 miles out, you know, some phantoms from the Enterprise caught up with it. Uh, thank God. The Enterprise was the only nuclear carrier we had at the time, and it had been steaming across the Pacific to try to get up, mm -hmm. up there. And just at the last minute, two of the phantoms <clears throat> caught up with it. Apparently their orders are, <clears throat> normal situation is, if there's any bomber in its wartime, they open the bomb bay doors, they shoot them down immediately. Um, so I never saw the, the badger. Uh, but then, all of a sudden, boom, this huge explosion, the whole ship shakes. Was it, we're still here. We, we figured we get hit, you know. <laughs> what it turned out being is our, even though the, the phantoms from the Enterprise caught up with it, our one of the five-inch guns on our ship shot a warning shot ahead of the, uh, the Badger. We didn't know what was going to happen. We thought it was the end of the world. <laughs> so that was, that was tense. <laughs> oh, understandable. And then there were two other occasions when I was on the flight deck and other Russian planes, a bear and a bison flew over. And uh, because it was cold, I was actually sitting in the cockpit all with everything closed so I could try to keep warm. Mm -hmm. And I could see them in these. They were like, they seemed like they were bigger than the B-52s. The phantoms would be around them, right near them, and they looked like mosquitoes around a, uh, a condor or something, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, it was very tense the whole time. Um, then we had another incident. Um, I was there, we were there about a month before we got any mail, and my mother had sent me some articles from the Boston Globe explaining what was going on, and still we didn't know we were at war. But then, um, because we were at sea so long, normally when you're in sea for a long time, either the oilers come out or the supply ships come out, and you go side by side with the carrier and a destroyer or a cruiser on the other side. They call it UNREP, Underway Replenishment. And on its own, it can be dangerous. You have to maintain the same speed, if the waters are choppy, the ships can tend to like tip and go towards each other, um, so it can be dangerous. And it was kind of choppy that day, so we're up there on the flight deck watching it. And uh, all of a sudden, um, you know, we had a bird's eye view of everything on the flight deck. 
all of a sudden we see the Russian trolley, it was with us every day for 46 days. It starts coming over like more behind us, still way back. So we're kidding, we said, this guy wants a pretty good view, you know, he wants to really <laughs> check it out. And they had all this electronic equipment on the trawler. So then um, it starts coming forward a little. And we're saying, boy, this guy is pretty ballsy, you know. Mm. And, and we're kind of wondering, well, where are the destroyers, you know, putting up with this? And, uh, and you know, not only we bring supplies over, but we, we get the oil lines coming over to get the oil. So he keeps coming up. And we're like, is this guy serious? And he must have got, I'd say, 100 yards behind us, right like in the middle of where all the ships were, between us and the oiler, and he's still coming up. Mm -hmm. you know, we're getting panicky at this time. So it was a dangerous situation, but it was a funny part of it. So we're looking, all of a sudden we see stuff bouncing off the trawler. We said, what the hell is going on? So we had to actually get down and lay on the carrier because if we couldn't lean over, it would fall over. Mm. And we looked down, and apparently we had put extra supplies on the weather decks because we didn't know how many. So the guys are throwing potatoes <laughs> at the Russian trawler. <laughs> and so we're focusing on that. We're starting to laugh. All of a sudden, we had lost our other focus and a destroyer. I thought it was going to cut them right in half. Oh, dear. So it was almost like an international incident, you know, and... You know, you hear about stuff like this. I've heard about, even since I've been in, that the navies get together and they do stupid things, like playing a game of chicken, you know. So, mm. um, so but as a result of that, we had to do an emergency breakaway. Um, and in this, I think there was a destroyer on the other side. Emergency breakaway is you just go your separate ways. The oil lines snap and the oil goes flying. Any other lines you have snap. So we did that, the destroyer, and then a couple of destroyers just circled the guy. And of course, we're turning like crazy, like this. Um, and then I went down to the, uh, the flight deck was still slippery. I think I went down, down to the hangar bay to see what might have happened. And one guy was just covered in oil. It was, wow. so that was a pretty uh, nasty incident, mm. really. It, it was a pretty funny part. It was one of the funniest things I ever remember. But, mm -hmm. but it was funny. The guys were serious. They were seriously throwing potatoes at the Russian trawler. <laughs> were they catching it? <laughs> they were hitting it. And that's yeah. why. That's what we first saw. We saw stuff bouncing off the trolley. Mm. What the hell is that? My goodness. <laughs> so then, anyway, after um, a couple of times, we were right outside Wonsan Harbor. Eventually, two other carriers got up there, including the Enterprise, and one day I counted about 30 ships up there. Mm -hmm. We were supposed to be in the Tonkin Gulf, uh, so finally we got relieved. We stopped in Yokosuka, got more supplies, and went down to the Tonkin Gulf. We were a month late, another carrier had to stay an extra month until we get down there. So again, this is the first Westpac, and we arrive in the Tonkin Gulf, and you, you go out in the Tonkin Gulf for 30 to 40 to 50 days at a time. There's usually two or three carrier forces. <clears throat> um, the, primarily, they have the attack carriers, which carry the jets, you know. And, and at the time, um, even though we were anti-submarine, we did a lot of reconnaissance work. Mm -hmm. we, were, we would go in closer to the shore, actually, and our planes could stay in the air about six hours, and they had a thing called Operation Market Time. <clears throat> Aside from helping to look for maybe down, other downed planes, uh, when the destroyers lined up offshore to fire, our planes would spot their fire. In other words, adjust your fire to this, this, mm -hmm. and this. And e even at night as well. Um, so that was our primary role there. Um, and um, so we did that off and on, you know, for months. And um, one night uh, I came up, and one day I came up, I worked day shift. Mm -hmm. um, originally, all the deck crew worked nonstop. You had, um, it's just the way it was set up. Like, originally, if I was a plane captain, I would just have to be with the plane constantly. If I needed sleep, I'd have to sleep in the plane or on the plane, get meals when I could. And then the flight deck crew, similar thing. Uh, 
but a lot of people were getting seriously injured. It's mm -hmm. a dangerous place on a good day. Mm -hmm. So then they, we went to 12-hour shifts. Anyway, I came up one morning and one of our planes had disappeared off the radar screen and um, it was assumed that it was a direct hit. Of course, they're kind of pretty easy targets to be in a, a propeller plane, you know, they're not very fast. Plus we were going a little lower to spot for the destroyers and mm -hmm. stuff. And so it was the, the air crewman that replaced me, another air crewman, the guy had just had twins. Mm -hmm. There was a guy, Ensign Benson, uh, we didn't know it, but he had just gotten promoted to Lieutenant Junior Grade. And then the co one of the commanders, our second in command, um, and they never found anything. Um, so, you know, it, it hits home. And um, again, years later, I'm on my military website, and there's his daughter. Anybody know my father? She had actually traveled to Vietnam to try to find more about her father, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, after years, after years, it just really hits you more so when you're an adult. And right. You, mm -hmm. And you say, geez, uh, we were just kids, you know. And, mm -hmm. um, so anyway, that's, uh, that was the big events of that cruise. We crossed the equator. There's a big tradition in the Navy when you cross the equator. A big, um, um, you go from being a polywog to a shellback. There's this whole big elaborate initiation. It's <laughs> kind of nasty. I get some photos of that. Um, but um, uh, so that was our cruise there. And actually it was a pretty eventful cruise, not the norm. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're all eventful in some ways. Then uh, for a while, the uh, we heard that the uh, New Jersey got recommissioned, the old battleship New Jersey. Mm -hmm. I never saw it. Uh, the old ship was very hot, sleeping below. So sometimes I'd come out in the fan tail, the ass end of the ship, to just to get cool. And uh, you'd watch the destroyers, so you'd hear boom, 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 which was in New Jersey, you know, it's much bigger guns. And then one night I had bought a radio on the ship, and uh, I heard Saigon Sally, actually. And uh, it was kind of funny, but it was kind of eerie. Um, you know, you hear in World War II about Tokyo Rose. Mm -hmm. And she was mentioning some of our names, not my name, but some of the other names of... Now, it's not that difficult to get that info, but it's still kind of hairy. And mostly we chuckled about it more than anything, but it was still kind of odd to hear that. All right. <laughs> so how long was this first cruise? First cruise was, um, let me see, it was about seven months. Mm -hmm. We got back actually the 4th of July off San Diego, but because of the holiday, they didn't want to want us to come in and have people work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we watched the, uh, the, we watched the uh, fireworks in San Diego. We made our own fireworks too. They were watching us, so that was pretty cool. <laughs> okay, so what happened after that? Well, we were back a short time and, um, and they were decommissioning some of the anti-submarine squadrons. We had heard that there was going to be a new plane, and apparently that's what was going on. So they were starting to make cutbacks. Mm -hmm. So uh, we all got new orders. We were there. I was back in San Diego until like early September. Then I got orders. I had to go back over seas, but I had to. I was going to be working on jets, so they sent me to Whidbey Island, Washington for a month where, again, I had the same type of training. I had to learn all about the plane, pass a test to be a plane captain, mm -hmm. and then we also had the ordnance training there. In this case, we actually, in the Navy, in those days, maybe it was because of the war, but we loaded bombs by hand. You had machines to do it, but there was no space or time mm -hmm. in 1968 and 69 to be loading bombs with a machine. Um, so part of it was we had to not only learn how to properly do it, but they actually had us put two of us on like on a 250-pound bomb, me and a kid from the Bronx that I knew. And he couldn't get his half up, so I got my half, and on the, on the intruders, you put a bar in the front of the bomb. There's a screw where the fuse goes in eventually, but you put a big bar on there so two guys can get on. And on the back, you put another bar underneath and one, two, three, and you go up. And you couldn't just like go up here. You had to really 
get up there because the, the bomb racks were kind of high, so it was made it a little higher. So I got my front end hooked in, but he never got his hooked oh, in. No. So he was embarrassed, and after that, mm -hmm. he really started lifting weights and to get stronger. You know, he was from mm -hmm. the Bronx. Mm -hmm. So yeah. anyway, then uh, once I was trained, um, I was sent. I flew out of um, San Francisco, Travis Air Force Base. Um, there was a bunch of us going overseas, not just for the for my new ship and squadron, but mm -hmm. a bunch of us, and we stopped in. Uh, Hawaii for fuel and Wake Island. Wake Island, the whole world, everybody gets up to see people because there's nobody there, you know. Uh, and then we flew into um, uh, Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines. In San Francisco, I had to have my dress blues on, which are wool, because of the time. It was, I think it was late September. Mm -hmm. So I go into Clark Air Force Base. It's 110 with my blues. And then we had to take a uh, school bus, basically. 50 miles down a mountainous terrain down to uh, Alongapo, um, it's called Subic Naval Station, and then there's also QB Point Naval Air Station, um, and that's where the carriers would come in there sometime. Mm -hmm. So another funny story, I just, some of these memories just pop. <laughs> so we're hot as hell, we had flown 17 hours, they made the most senior guys sign a thing, you can't have alcohol. It was hot, dusty, and we were dying. And all of a sudden, <laughs> the bus comes to a screeching halt. Dust goes flying. I see this little shack, no bigger than this room, all rickety old shack. Old sign, coldest beer in Bataan. You know, we're there, yes! You know? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we get out, and um, <laughs> we were thirsty as hell. And. Uh, so we just line up to get some beer, and they had one of the old style coolers, you know, they were in the water. They take the cap off, and they give me one, and I look, and it's like green up, up, up around the, he says, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, as long as it was we were, cold. We were thirsty. Uh -huh. It wasn't that cold either. Ah. Um, so then uh, I, I had to uh, stay um, at the base in, uh, in fact, I just remember another story. I'm sorry I'm getting off tangent. That's all right. The memories are coming back. Um, so I was there, what they call TDY, temporary duty, waiting to get flown out to the USS Constellation because I was now assigned to VA-196. Again, VA is, A is for attack. And I was working on what they call the A-6 intruders, mm -hmm. which were medium-sized bombers. Great plane. Um, but I had to wait a few days to go out so they would have a sorting mail, uh, doing different things. Then the um, Philippines were kind of a backward country at the time, really backward. Um, shacks, no real like sewage system. Uh, we got awakened one morning, wake up, wake up, there's a fire in Longapo. And we all had firefighting training, you know, and um, so um, they took us in a, one of the paddy wagons out to the fire, and Philippines at the time, life was kind of cheap. Uh, I have to, I mean, this was a town where servicemen came in, so that was part of it, but life was kind of cheap, even though they were all Christians, you know. Um, but, so we arrived at the scene of the fire, and they had like, an old rinkety kind of fire truck, no fire hydrants, no water system. And luckily the place, the, the shacks are just one or two story max. So we get there and we see that um, half the um, building are, and they're all right together, you know. So we get out and it's like, it's like a, a football game, something everybody's cheering and watching and there's these two little guys on the fire hose and they were having a hard time just pulling the hose. So we get out, mm -hmm. we put our sailor hats down. We had no proper equipment. And uh, so the guy was in front of me. We just took the hose from the other guy. I was second on the hose. And the second guy, he hold up this big thing to protect the rest of us from the heat. So we're going along and um, get the other guys out of the way. We're doing pretty good. We know how to put out fires. And all of a sudden, the guy in front of me trips, and then I trip. Look, and it was some bodies, you know, and uh, I couldn't smell anything. They, mm -hmm. I never smelled 
burned flesh, they say it smells bad. But, um, and then there was a whole wall, two-story wall of fire beside us, and we're getting ready to do that, and we run out of water. So, um, and it's, it's then when we figured out they don't have a sewer system with hydrants, so we had to back off. They hooked up another truck. Long story short, we put out the, uh, the fire. Uh, old buildings, and uh, it was pretty easy to put them out, actually. Um, but I was kind of appalled that nobody was helping the firemen. You know, mm -hmm. it was, so mm -hmm. anyway, so anyway, finally I um, got the orders to fly out to the constellation. Uh, it's uh, CVA sixty four, um, and when I get out there, uh, instead of being a plane captain again, they already had the regular plane captains. So they put me in temporary duty, fixing all the equipment, tractors and everything that towed all the planes and all that stuff, uh, fixing the engines and doing stuff like that. Um, so I wasn't on the flight deck very much there, but, uh, but I'd go up as often as I could to watch. I couldn't go on the flight deck, but I'd go up to the island structure and watch them. Mm -hmm. um, and um, this was during the 1968 was a wicked year. Um, they, I mean, we normally on the attack carriers, they had upwards of 90 planes. And in 68 with the Tet Offensive and all the way the war was going, I mean, it was like nonstop day and night warning. Plus we were in, we were still in Yankee Station. Yankee Station in the Tonkin Gulf was above the 20th parallel uh, so that they could quicker flights to bombing the north, you know. They had mm -hmm. made the uh, decision to bring them down to what they call Dixie Station. Um, and um, so it was really busy on the flight deck. And, and when I get on my last time over, bottom line is, is when you're that busy, everybody has to load bombs, you know. Uh, they have certain guys assigned to, to that. But, you know, you might recover 40 planes, and within two hours, another 40 or 50 are going to go out again loaded with anywhere from 10 to 30 bombs each, you know, and um, let alone uh, loading rockets and stuff like that. So when it was that busy, everybody had to just pitch in mm -hmm. and, and load. Um, in the Constellation, that air group, meaning all the planes with, with that with the USS Constellation, we dropped more bombs than it had ever been dropped in all na naval aviation history. So our air group got a special commendation, meritor meritorious unit commendation. I mean, you look at all the bombs and you say, how can there be anything left? You know, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, if, and mostly they were 500 pound bombs, sometimes 1,000 pound bombs. and. Um, but, I mean, you're going 24 hours a day like this, and it's like, wow. And, you know, losing planes as well, and um, um, not recovering a lot of the guys. I know a lot of the MIAs, I know some of them personally, and luckily we got a couple back. Um, but, um, you know, it just, it was a very busy thing. And, um, I remember they had, in the, every cruise you get, you lose some people, not just the pilots, but on the flight deck. Um, at least seriously injured, or somebody gets blown over the side, or um, occasionally they get swallowed by a jet. Um, and, you know, you're busy, I mean, part of the reason I got sent back over because I was experienced, and so if they needed me, I could go up and I'm ex now we're talking jets versus props, it's different, but I, I know how to be careful. And even then, one person makes a wrong decision and, and one or a bunch of people are going to get seriously hurt or killed. And it's just life on the flight deck. We get hazardous mm -hmm. duty pay for it, actually. Um, so I remember one day I came out in the hangar bay and there's this engine and I'm looking at it. And I said, what's it doing here? Because if they had to fix an engine, they brought it into our area. And then I'm looking, I said, what's that? And it was skin. You know, a guy had got sucked in, you know, they pulled from his legs. Out. You know, it's a meat grinder is what mm -hmm. it is, you know. Wow. 
and they purposely put it there for us to look and to be reminded. Mm -hmm. I mean, we weren't purposely careless, but one false move, you know, mm -hmm. somebody's, you know, it could be, I, like I said, I had four incidents. The first was up in, and the other three were on the USS Ranger. But So anyway, we, um, we did that there. We lost four or six planes during that cruise. Um, some of the planes were lost. We knew exactly where, and then a year later they would find the pilot's helmet hundreds of miles down river. Maybe it floated down river mm -hmm. or something. Um, and wherever possible, they would send crews in to rescue them, you know, but a lot of times they were, they were already dead. Uh, but also, too, the MiGs were doing a number on us over there. We had the Phantoms, but if you ever watched the movie Top Gun, you know what happened. You know, mm -hmm. we were getting our butt kicked, so they developed Top Gun. And also, the Phantoms, for a while, didn't have machine guns for clo close quarters um, mm -hmm. dogfighting, you know. So for quite a while, uh, we were taking hits, and that's why they developed Top Gun, as the movie uh, said. Um, so anyway, uh, we get back in the at, I got on, I got on the uh, Constellation early October, and we got back, I think it was February 1st of 69. Um, then I had emergency leave, my grandparents were dying, so I came back to Natick for a while. Mm -hmm. And from there, I w went back to Whidbey Island. It, our squadron was based out of Naval Air Station, Whidbey Island, Washington, mm -hmm. uh, up near the Canadian border. And I was there, again, continuing to work as a plane captain, and mm -hmm. I had made some rating, but... Um, and then we started, our next cruise was going to be on the USS Ranger, which is CBA-61. And, and again, a few months beforehand, you start, we go to Fallon, Nevada, the desert, to do bombing runs to help train the pilots, really hot. And then two to three times before the actual cruise, we would go off the coast of California, out of Alameda, go on sail under mm -hmm. the Golden Gate Bridge. And um, again, just training, basically mm -hmm. training for everyone. And then um, we left mid-October of 69 uh, for the USS Ranger. And um, again, as before, we stopped at Hawaii um, and we, this time, you know, the Pueblo thing was over. We, no, actually, we, we stopped before going down to the Tonkin Gulf. We stopped for a couple of days up at the uh, Sea of Japan right off of Korea because the crisis still had not been resolved. And then we sailed down without much, too much delay down to the Tonkin Gulf. And, um, so, um, Again, I was back full time on the flight deck, and the typical crews were well. In some ways, it was typical. But then, what was happening was nobody in the United States knew it. But in late '69 and '70, and I just found this out again on the Military Channel a couple mm -hmm. of years ago. We heard all these rumors, but it was true. We were the Ho Chi Minh Trail went down into Laos, went through between Laos and Cambodia. Mm -hmm. And that's where all their supplies would come up. So that was the main mission a lot of times. And on, there were two big like mountain ranges. On one were all anti-aircraft, and the other was all the radar. Mm -hmm. Our pilots had to fly down right in the middle of it. I, you know, I really started seeing a lot of really scared pilots. We'd, we'd get them all set to go. And they'd be up there, just, you know, they're waiting their turn, and they're just looking at their family, you know, crossing themselves, saying prayers. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we lost, I, I think out of my squad, and we lost three or four, but two were rescued, and the other squadrons lost some. And on the, and um, we had one, um, miraculous uh, recovery. 
we had guys, I, I know for a long time they were MIA, now they're listed as KIA, but we mm -hmm. had pilots shot down and they were alive on the ground and we never heard from them again. Sometimes our pilots would go down and would actually see them. They might be rolling around semi-conscious. But also, they all had the radios. They could communicate with us off the ship. And I didn't know this for a while. Finally, they said, let's get down to the ready room, see what's going on. And we went in one day, and one of the pilots was talking to us, not us, but to the ready room, trying to give his position. And the other pilots knew that the Viet Cong were all around them. And they're talking to him, trying to support him and comfort him. And finally, he says, I can't talk, they're all around me. Never heard from the guy again, you know. And that, that's really, that's scary. And then you see their wives when you get back to the States. One, one woman, her hair turned white by the time you get back. Mm -hmm. um, but there was a lot of that in, you know, the other branches too. And so then we had one, one uh, crew shot down and they knew right where they were. They had them spotted and um, Again, the enemy was all around, so they, the other planes and the helicopters threw smoke. They couldn't get them, though, so they went back the next morning. And neither of the guys knew it, but they were like 50 yards apart, but in a thick jungle, you know? So our squadron colors were orange and black, you know, like Halloween. One of the pilots, actually he's called a bombardier navigator, he had taken one of our curtains from the barracks, bright orange, you know, and he put it in here. So when he was down, he laid it out so they could pinpoint him from the sky, you know. Mm -hmm. He told me that later. Mm -hmm. And um, so then the next day they went in and it was pretty hairy, but the, we call the helicopters angels because mm -hmm. they rescued people. So the angels got them, plucked them right out, took them over to Thailand, got them drunk for a couple of days. And one guy had his leg injured, so he, he got a... Mm -hmm. So then the other guy came back, he was a nice guy. Um, and we had a squadron party and we were talking to him. And the look on his face, it was, you know, it was so obvious of a guy who had cheated death, you know, a sure death or torture. He, mm -hmm. he was so thankful. Um, you know, it really strikes you. Mm -hmm. um, and again, years went by. I went and visited the Roaming Wall, actually, in Concord, New Hampshire. And, I looked at the books, some of them were still MIA, some of them were KIA, and again, some of these were guys that we knew were alive. Mm -hmm. um, so that was always pretty, pretty tough. And, and most of it, like I said, there was the officers and the enlisted men, but I get to know all the officers, because I'm up there not only checking their plane and pre-flighting, but at the last minute I'm getting them all hooked up and mm -hmm. answering their questions, making sure everything's all set. And uh, so I got to know them, you know. And boy, were they scared, late 69. And nobody in the country knew we were actually bombing in Laos and Cambodia, mm -hmm. and we were. Um, and, um, but just the looks on their faces, you know. And there was this one guy, he had been a big football star at, at the Naval Academy, big rugged guy. And all of a sudden, in the middle of all this, you know, they sat in their, their seat, which was also an ejection seat, and there's different ways they could eject. One of them was they, the best way is to pull the thing over your face in case any glass might come in when you go through it. Um, and this guy, I didn't say anything, but he was scared. He, he, he said, is this, can I get, and he was looking for a way out is what he was looking for. He was asking me, he said, am I, is that going to clear my head if I pull it? And I'm looking, and it was, yeah, I was in a, Mm -hmm. Tough position. I didn't say too much, but I, I could tell it was fear, you know. And I didn't blame the guy at all, but mm -hmm. um, uh, but that's what you know. You know, the guys in the ground in country. I mean, they saw the worst of it. But then you get somebody throwing bombs on people. They can't wait to get their hands on you. I mean, mm -hmm. I I would be that way if somebody was bombing me all the time. You mm -hmm. know? So, um, and like I said. Uh, there was a lot of people that were alive on the ground, and we never found a trace of them after that. So that's pretty scary stuff. It is. It is. So. All right. So you're on the Ranger. How long was that cruise? That was mid-October through 
July, like mid-July mm -hmm. of 70. And what happened after that? Well, um, got back. Um, at that point, I had about uh, seven months left. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting in the chow hall at, on Whidbey Island. One of my friends, hey, Bob, he yells at her, hey, Bob, you're getting out early, you know. And they had a thing where uh, they were letting a bunch of us out four months early. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of a nice feeling. I had just bought a car, first car I ever really had. Mm -hmm. It was a beautiful summer up there in Washington, really beautiful, and just waiting to get out. Mm -hmm. One of my best friends from Queens, he got, he got news that uh, his father had had an accident, so he had to go home on emergency leave, and he and I were like brothers. Finally, got a couple of letters from him. We had to send his stuff home. They were keeping him back there while his father recovered and eventually his father died and his mother died within six months of each other. Wow. And he was 20, his only child, 22 years old. So that was pretty tough mm -hmm. for him. One of my other friends, the other guy from the Bronx that couldn't load the bomb, I always thought he was Italian the way he looked, but he was Greek. Um, and his first name was Alpha. I'm not going to say his last name. And the poor guy, he was like sad sack in the Navy. He was kind of a dumb guy. His attitude was, my, he ended up with all the crummy jobs. And we all liked him. He was a good guy. Um, so we get back, when we get back on the Constellation, uh, was it the Constellation? Yeah, or no, it was the Ranger, I guess. Anyway, his parents had died two weeks before we get back. He was never notified. Oh, no. A poor guy, you know. So, um, actually, eventually, I, we get out. I had my car. I was going to drive cross-country. He and I were pretty good friends, friends, so he asked to come. So we drove my car down the west coast, across the bottom, up the east coast. I dropped him off in the Bronx, New York. And aside from what had happened to him with his parents, the Bronx, New York, I felt bad dropping the guy off mm -hmm. there, you know. And uh, he was a good guy. Mm -hmm. um, Did you keep in touch with him? Not him, no. He, he would be the type, he, he, if I wrote him, he wouldn't write back. <laughs> he just, uh, I don't want to paint him as a, he was a really good guy. He's just mm -hmm. one of these different kind of guys. And then with what happened to him on top of that, you know. He, mm. But after, he, for a while when we got back, he started lifting weights because he did, decided he was going to be a butcher and he really needed to buff bulk up to be chopping up the meat, chopping up the meat all the time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then my other friend who was from Queens, um, I was home and uh, I got a call uh, from Kachichuit. He said, I'm, a, I'm at this place, where's Worcester, you know? And <laughs> he described and I said, no, I know where you are. And I came and his parents had died and mm -hmm. he, he was hurting. I, I could tell he wasn't quite himself. But being another young guy, I didn't realize just how hurt he was. So he stayed for a couple of days. We went on a couple of clubs. Um, mm -hmm. And I went down to visit him one time. But he, he went through a bad period there. I mean, he was a single child, first of all, and uh, probably a little spoiled, even though he was from Queens. He mm -hmm. had a pretty good life. And, but both parents, within a six-month period, you know, when you're 22, that's, right. that's tough. Well, talk about you just getting out of the Navy and the anti-war movement was yeah. hitting the crest. Yeah. What was that like? Well, even before getting out, um, the, in San Diego, San Diego, when I was there, was voted the most beautiful city in the country. Mm -hmm. To me, it was more like a huge town. The downtown area was one street and it was all servicemen. Mm -hmm. You didn't even see girls, you know. Uh, they, although the YMCA had a dance, we used to go there to meet girls, you know. And, um, and they came in purposely just to... Um, but all the hills out there, La Jolla and all that, were just hills, barren hills. I went, I went back out there in 2001 for my nephew's wedding and it's all built. It's like the typical city now, good, bad, and ugly. But anyway, of course, at the time, we had short hair in the military, and everybody was growing their hair long. People harassed us even before I went overseas. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it was not a popular war. I understand that. Uh, at first, I was shocked. Um, 
And so we, you know, girls would, would be walking, girls would stop by in a car, flip us the bird, or yell at us, and, and we're like, um, we didn't know what to do really. And, but then, and then when I was overseas, the, the only communication was the Stars and Stripes newspaper would get that maybe once a month. And in 68, I remember reading about the, the riots in Watts. I'm like, what's going on? I, I thought there was a physical revolution going on in the country because I had heard something about anti-war. And, and then I come back and um, people are all going like this. I said, oh, they're patriotic. When I grew up, this meant victory. Mm -hmm. But now it's the peace sign. You know? mm -hmm. And uh, so that was quite a... You, you learn very quickly, even before I went over, you learn very quickly. I mean, we couldn't hide it because we had short hair. Um, but you learn very quickly, you know, and you, you know, you just had to tolerate it, you know, mm -hmm. and it was tough. And, um, and, you know, so I've been back and forth three times. And then in California was the, wor the worst, you know, all the hip, you know, I, I read in the paper about a year ago that, you know, a lot of vets complain about being spit on and, and stuff like that. And, and they say, oh, that's not, it. I was spit on, I was spit at by hippies mm -hmm. in Alameda. The last time I stepped off the ship, I had been called a baby killer a couple of times in two separate incidents. I gave a kid a ride home from Framingham State. He was hitchhiking, just giving him a ride. He heard his name, and I'm, oh, you're a baby killer. And I was so shocked. It's a good thing I was shocked. I would have pounded him, you know. Mm. Uh, I don't take crap from anybody. Right. I can understand anti-war and all that. Don't give, don't give me the stuff to my mm -hmm. face, you know. Okay. And, um, and again, we were all macho type of guys. You don't back down from a fighter. You just don't take crap from people. Mm -hmm. And when I was growing up, you had to fight. Um, so that was tough. I mean, I eventually, you know, I learned, uh, in, when I first went to Framingham State to register, one of the professors pulled a couple of us aside. He says, you might not want to talk about your, you know, I hear it was a little longer then. And, you know, it was good for him to say that, but, you know, mm -hmm. it, that was about four years <laughs> after the fact that we understood. Right. So you got out in 1970? Yeah, October 1st of 70. And what was your uh, rating? Uh, ABH3, it's called an Aviation Boatsman, Boatswain's Mates Third Class Petty Officer. Mm -hmm. And basically those were the guys who, um, um, on land and on the carrier, I was assigned to a squadron, but on the carrier, the other ones were the yellow shirts on the carrier. They mm -hmm. would direct the planes, give them all the signals and all that. Right. So I just did that. I, Like I said, I had been sent out as a jet mechanic to a squadron with uh, propellers, so I said, right. so I, I didn't even think about that for mm -hmm. a while. So you were just mentioning Framingham States. Yep. You, uh, I take it you went there? Yeah, the, the one, I knew a little about it before I went in, but thank God for the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I couldn't afford any other colleges. I was a straight A student in parochial school. Mm -hmm. I was third behind Rich. Rich was the, uh, <laughs> the top guy. Uh, Rich, in case you're uh, curious, is Richie Sullivan, who happens to be my older brother. Yeah, and um, and then even in uh, in uh, I, I I didn't go to Marion High School. I went to uh, Coolidge Junior High for a year. Mm -hmm. Then I went up to Natick High for three years, and mostly I get A's. I was mm -hmm. I wasn't the smart. I worked for my grades, but I, I was a good student, and um, and that's why I'm glad to that I decided to join rather than get drafted. Or even join the Marines and just stay on guard duty all the time. Mm, right. you know, I learned about aviation and stuff. Mm -hmm. But then I hadn't thought about it much until getting out. Geez, the GI Bill, and that's perfect for me. You know, I, I never had any money for college. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had lived in the housing project. So now that I was home and an adult, my mother had to move out. It was a good situation for her. So she bought a house, so I lived at home in college. I fixed up her house and, and went to school, and I worked and uh, tried out for hockey, too. I almost flunked out the first semester because I just <laughs> didn't have any time to I had to study, you know. I just right. couldn't ace it like that. You mm -hmm. know? But then I finally did well. I ended up with a um, Bachelor of Arts in Psychology at Framingham State and a minor in Sociology. 
And then there were no jobs, and I still had some GI Bill left, but you couldn't use it for a master's degree. So I said, there's no jobs. So a bunch of us went up to Assumption College and got our master's in psychology and counseling. And, then, and I took a government loan out. And then once I finished, then they said, oh yeah, you can use it for your master's. <laughs> so actually, once I was in New Hampshire eventually, I actually took a bunch of master's level business courses in New mm -hmm. Hampshire just to use it, you know. Right. And what career did you eventually go into? I, um, you know, there wasn't much to choose from. Um, after being unemployed three months, I went to Framingham. They had the government pro program, the Comprehensive Employment and Training Act, called the CEDA program. Mm -hmm. And they saw my credentials and they just said, here's the, the jobs we have. So I, I actually picked up a job as a correctional social worker at MCI Concord, just because it was related to my field. I had mm -hmm. never thought or planned on going into the criminal justice system at all. Um, and uh, that was a one-year job. So then I, once it, before the year was up, I got a job at a pre-release center in Framingham, South Middlesex pre-release as a correctional officer, correctional counselor, case manager, working with guys coming out of Walpole. Mm -hmm. um, so I did that for a while. And I decided I wanted to live in Seacoast, New Hampshire. So I transferred up to New Hampshire. I worked up to the pre-release center or halfway house up there. Um, I had worked at MCI Concord. I don't know if I mentioned yes, that. Mm -hmm. And then I went up. I was working for the state prison in New Hampshire, but I was in the halfway house program. Then I became the manager of the minimum security unit. And eventually, um, I ended up my career. The last 17 years, I was probation parole officer in New Hampshire. And up there, we did serious work. We supervised people. We carried weapons. Um, we actively supervised people. It's not like mm -hmm. you hear probation. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. We, and we had the powers of arrest, uh, searches. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and eventually, um, I had a mandatory arrest in 2004. Uh, my buddy and I, my partner, who was a former um, uh, police officer up there, we had worked together a lot. And uh, there was this one guy, a month went by when our computer lab system was down. So he was using drugs all this time. And he's not supposed to be using anything, obviously. And he was a special intensive treatment program. And if he wasn't in that program, he was in jail or prison. That's the way it worked. It was right. his last chance. So normally I would have caught up with him within a week if he had positive drug screens and we would have arrested him then. It was autumn in that his case was a mandatory arrest. But a month went by and he's using he was also um, he legitimately had when I say legitimately, he legitimately had a diagnosis of anxiety disorder. And I say legitimately because I have degrees in psychology, and there's mm -hmm. a lot of people out there that have some kind of uh, handy uh, diagnosis. But he did, and uh, so he had all kinds of prescription drugs, illegal drugs. And um, we went to his house the night before to get him. And um, then we decided we'll get him. He was right in the court where they had the program. He said, let's get him when he comes in. Sometimes we would purposely arrest him in front of the other folks to show them that we're not kidding, you know? Right. And the counselors love that. Mm -hmm. So he came in. He comes in with his daughter. And he knew we had to catch up with him sooner or later. He wasn't supposed to bring his daughter. So anyway, the counselor said, I'll take the daughter and call his mother. Because obviously we don't want to put the child in the middle of that. Anyway, um, we confront him, and uh, so I said, uh, Bob, you're under arrest. I took his drink that he had in his hand before he walked me with it. And then his daughter comes out, Daddy! And I, oh. So uh, he picks her up. Of course, he wanted to go and take her home. He said, no, you're under arrest. The counselor will take care of your daughter. I, th I thought for sure he was going to use her as a hostage, you know. And... Um, I was about to take my cuffs out, and um, as soon as the daughter came out, I left them. And, you know, I had a cuff holder, but it was convenient to put them back here. Mm -hmm. 
So anyway, he starts to comply. He, he gives the daughter to the counselor, and they're all down. And I'm, I'm not in the proper position. I'm leaning to listen to, to see what he's going to say in court the next day. Um, and he basically was like a sucker punch, although it was like football. He, he, came, he leaped out of that. He was a bigger guy, a real strong young guy. And I see his face in front of me. I go, it was like I was a linebacker who wasn't paying attention, you know. Luckily, my partner was back. It was a small space. Mm -hmm. Normally, we would, have, we would have more space. Mm -hmm. And luckily, my head hit his shin because I hit the floor hard, landed on the cuffs. And it, luckily, the adrenaline kicked in before I hit the floor. Then we're chasing him out in the woods. It's winter. And then all of a sudden, I, and we're, we're both carrying, you know, and I'm concerned about him getting my partner in the dark and getting his gun. And um, so then I remembered, hey, wait a minute, there's water there. He's going to have to double back. So sure enough, he's crashing through. Anyway, he gets out in the road, which is down from the jail, and he gets right in front of a car, and they pick him up. So I said, I'll stop in front of the truck, and not knowing how, how much I was injured. And um, then a car is coming with me. I at least wanted to get the license plate, but cars are coming my way, so I had to get out of the way. So anyway, he got away. We got him a couple of weeks later. Of course, I should have remembered from the sports that I did play a lot of times without pads that you, you don't feel a lot of stuff till the next day. Oh, dear. <laughs> so... Um, my, uh, we were kind of chuckling about it afterwards. I hadn't got hit like that in a while. So then the other, my partner says, uh, you're going to be uh, sore tomorrow, because of course he saw the whole thing, you know. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, long story short, I got worse. The emergency room doctor did not do the proper tests, mm -hmm. and my injuries were a lot worse than we even imagined, and I just kept getting worse. Um, I obviously landed on my cuffs. I had two fractures. One of the ligaments he had detached, and then I had two um, bulging discs. So anyway, I learned everything about back problems through that. And after 16 months, I just got worse. One of the discs, I call it popped. It herniated, mm -hmm. and I had, I've got nerve damage down here. So I had to retire is the bottom line. Wow. Um, I mean, that's the nature of it. I always knew something was going to happen. I figured mm -hmm. it would be a weapon. Mm -hmm. It was actually a hit. He wasn't trying to injure me, actually. He was trying to get away. Mm -hmm. So two days later, we find out from the DEA, whenever they went to get him, they brought three or four guys because he always ran on them. <laughs> we find mm -hmm. this afterwards. Okay. Uh, did you join any unit of the military reserve? No. Um, I drove cross country, and I was home for like a week, and the... Naval, Av Naval Air Station South Weymouth called me. Mm -hmm. They wanted me to be in the reserves in the crash crew. And, you know, after four years, I said, nah, mm -hmm. you know, I, I said, no thanks. How about any veterans organizations? No, I, I really haven't. Uh, they have the veterans in unit home pages now. Mm -hmm. And after like 30 something years, my friend from Queens, he was on that. He got my email address. So we've been. <laughs> communicating, and I've gone mm -hmm. to see him actually a few times. Yeah. Um, as far as, uh, were you ever, uh, did you ever visit uh, veterans posts like the Legion and kind of felt like some of the older veterans didn't exactly make you feel welcome? No, I didn't. I, um, I got calls from all of the posts, and I, I just wasn't, at the time, I wasn't ready for it. Mm -hmm. One of the things that uh, happened with us Vietnam vets, of course, a lot of the guys were in country, they got killed, they got maimed, uh, they did real serious time. So, uh, you know, kind of immature, some of the vets, some of the co real combat vets were a little um, condescending to the rest of us, you know, and, and um, part, of, part of that is, well, the whole war was unpopular. We get treated pretty shabby when we get home. I mean, that's just the fact. The guys my age, it's like the World War II vets. These were guys that didn't complain. You did your duty, and we were guys like that. Mm -hmm. You didn't brag. You were humble. You didn't brag about stuff you did. We did our duty. That was our job to do that. We got treated. I didn't expect any parades coming home. You know, I knew what I did. I did my service. I did my share. I joined up, and all of us did. Even guys who were drafted did their share, you know? And um, I can understand it wasn't popular, and I can understand all that. But for
for the people to then harass us on top of it. I mean, I'm I'm lucky. I'm surprised I didn't punch somebody out. You know, mm -hmm. I, I don't. But you know, being more mature, you know, mm -hmm. having gone through that, I realized where they were coming from and uh -huh. and their issues. You know, and so um, I really have to say that. Um, and I'm glad for this project because other veterans and other citizens, and we've learned the lesson now because now all the veterans get treated the way they should get treated. Mm -hmm. um, and it didn't happen with us. And I guarantee you, <clears throat> all the vet, all the vets, Vietnam vets, feel like me. They feel badly about that. They feel humiliated. Uh, but we're not going to complain. We don't complain. We don't speak out loud and pat ourselves on the back. Um, and it's a big issue. Uh, it's just <clears throat> something that was going on in the country at the time. And it's over with, mm -hmm. but still the hurt is there. Us guys went and we did our job for our country. We were proud, we were patriotic, and we get treated pretty shabbily. And we all understand that. But how many Vietnam vets, that's why I'm saying this here right now, so other people, even younger guys, can realize, and that's what's so good about this project. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you look at the World War II vets, those guys, they went through hell. And they never complained. That's where we get it. We were taught that from the greatest generation. But now it's very different. Um, and it's not sour grapes with me. It's just something that needs to be... And there's no easy way to address that in the country mm -hmm. now other than for people to understand that. Mm -hmm. That's why this project is real. I decided, I was looking at the question that says, I'm going to speak up because I know a lot of my other friends and vets won't do it. Mm -hmm. It's not inside us to be like that. Right. <clears throat> you were mentioning early in the interview that you wanted to save this for last, uh, Pearl Harbor. Yeah. Hit it. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, there was a question about memorable moments, a couple really, but again, being still young and not even having gone overseas, we had that accident and, um, you know, the mid-air collision, and then a couple of days later, we're pulling into Pearl Harbor. And, um, you know, you know, knowing about Pearl Harbor and World War II, which, you know, it's like magical in a sense, in one sense. <clears throat> so we're pulling in. And first of all, the beauty of, <laughs> of Hawaii and of Pearl Harbor itself. It's not like a big harbor. It's narrow, uh, and as we know now, it's shallow. So coming in, I was on the flight. I was not only on the flight deck. I was sitting in my plane that was on the bow, and I was actually sitting on the plane in the escape hatch there. So you're looking down at everything. And... Um, so we're going in, and just the sheer beauty I'm looking at, you look over to the right, there's Diamond Head, you look up, well, it, all the, um, the sugarcane fields, just a beautiful harbor. Then you're looking down at all these houses, they all had American flags. News helicopters were flying, they were waving to me, so I was waving back. Mm -hmm. I was actually hoping my mother would identify <laughs> me, you know, she, she got the wrong story, you know. Mm -hmm. And all the people are coming out of the house, they're waving flags, they're waving to us. And, uh, and you know, being a patriotic guy, knowing about Pearl Harbor and the beauty and everything, very memorable day. And then you go further in, there's the Arizona over there, and just the beauty of it all. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and after what happened, just that, all that stuff went together and it was just such a memorable moment. Mm -hmm. You are mentioning also Bob Hope? Yes. Um, oh, yeah, that's right. You, you got my notes there. Yes. Um, you know, long before I was in the military, Bob Hope, what a great guy, a funny guy. And my last time over on the Ranger, we didn't even have any advance warning. And uh, Christmas Eve, 69, oh, we're getting Bob Hope. And, I mean, I just love the guy himself. What an American hero Bob Hope was giving up all his time to mm -hmm. go be over with the troops and all the other people too. So we're getting Bob Hope. So of course we're all up there watching the helicopters come in and we had Connie Stevens. Mm -hmm. She's just as beautiful in person as she looked on the TV. We had the gold diggers. Oh boy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we had um, 
a show that I hadn't watched at the time much, Laughing. They had this woman from India called Teresa Graves. She was oh, a very attractive mm -hmm. woman. They had um, a couple of um, comedians, music magicians, and they had Neil Armstrong. Wow. And um, we had heard about the moon, and again, we got everything just through the stars and stripes. Mm -hmm. So then we get the show. I mean, the show is, is better in person than mm -hmm. it is on TV. And, uh, and then we get Neil Armstrong, and I was a little surprised. I didn't know anything about Neil Armstrong except he had walked on the moon, and he's talking to us, and very soft voice. I was kind of wondering if his voice was cracking or something. I was wondering if he had had some experience and mm -hmm. he wasn't crying, but he seemed to be like choking up or something. And I, but I wasn't close enough to really see him. And then, uh, so the show was so great. Then at the end, we're all in the hangar bay. Everybody sings Silent Night. And it was great till it was over. <laughs> then it was dead silence. We had to go back to our little cubby hole and mm -hmm. So it was a little depressing, but then the next day, they stayed a whole day with us. They're all over the ship, all the guys are, and the gold diggers loved it. I mean, they've seen other things, but they're right up close with us, and we're all checking them out, they're checking us out, and <laughs> Connie Stevens is walking on the flight deck, and the girl from Laughing, she's doing drills with the Marines, and um, Bob Hope's walking around. I mean, it was, you talk about a memory, you know? Mm. Definitely. It doesn't get any better than that. Mm -hmm. Bob, is there anything you wanted to uh, say before we end this let me, interview? Let me look at my own notes there you here. Go, right. I was trying to... Um, a lot of the stuff I, I uh, have already said, mm -hmm. I, I didn't realize I, you were going to have that, but uh, you know, especially the thing about supporting our troops. Mm -hmm. The other thing in general, I would say, I mean, it seems like humankind will always have wars. It seems to be human nature. And our country's been in a lot of it. And to me, in fact, the movie uh, Platoon uh, talked about this, spoke about this a little. I think most wars are fought by poor kids, mm -hmm. kids that don't have other advantages. You know, they can't, they have money for college and stuff. Yet even now, they're so patriotic. Uh, and now we have a volunteer. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's a lot more benefits for them now volunteering, but still, um, and, and being a young guy at the time, young and macho, looking for adventure, that's a part of being, <laughs> growing up as a man, you know, and I, I, I'm not sure if there were, um, you know, anybody that wasn't between 18 and 25, they would have enough troops to go to war, you know, mm -hmm. because once you get a little older, you realize, and as I realize now how fortunate I was to make it through, even though I was not being shot at every day. Mm -hmm. I hit four times on the flight deck where I came real close to either going over or getting sucked in a jet. Mm -hmm. And I look back at that, the two guys that replaced me as air crewmen are gone, it could have been me. So I wasn't even in heavy combat like a lot of the guys. And uh, you know, so obviously it matures you, but I think our society needs to understand that my general statement would be that, more so in the old days, that wars are fought by poor kids. Now with the volunteer ar army, it's still the same. Mm -hmm. you know? On the other hand, you have the officers, many of them who are just really patriotic and they're the leaders, you know, mm -hmm. the poor kids. And it's just, it's a philosophical issue with me that, and I'm sure it's that way in every other country that goes to war. Right. You know? mm -hmm. It's part of the human condition, I guess. Mm -hmm. But I felt like, I mean, I've thought that way for a long time, but I felt like I really needed to say that. Mm -hmm. you know, support the troops, no matter what the war, these guys, anybody who volunteers or puts on a uniform no matter what their role is, at any time, they could be put with a rifle on the front and lose their life. Mm -hmm. And they're volunteering to do that. So to me, the veterans, and especially the war, war veterans, are the best Americans of all. Uh, we appreciate it more. Mm, and we appreciate you coming here and <laughs> telling an incredible, incredible yeah. story. Of it's your... good, too. It's, it's kind of cathartic because yeah, we had it's... buried the stuff for so 
I could talk to all other vets, mm -hmm. but nobody else understands. So it, it's mm -hmm. good, it, and it's going to be a good learning experience for others too. Mm -hmm. I, I'm really, I really like the project. It's a good idea. Well, Robert W. Wright, we thank you so, so much for coming and okay. taking part. Okay.